um, in, in the spirit of, of coronavirus lockdown, um, I won't be showing myself in video today because I have locked down hair. I haven't seen a hairstylist since I don't remember when. So if you want to see what I look like, I'm on Twitter. <laughs> um, so I just want to start today by, by saying that because the worldwide situations are evolving so rapidly, that when I agreed to do this talk, we didn't have a civil rights situation going on. It was only COVID-19 as if that wasn't enough. And, and so I think I don't have a lot of this in the talk, but I, it's, it's start, starting to evolve my thinking in some ways that I'll mention later. Um, but I saw this, this meme this morning on Facebook, and this is something I've been thinking about all along, where you know, we've got protesters out in the thousands, some, are, some of whom are wearing PPE and some who aren't. I hope they open the pub soon. Don't be silly, it's not safe. So it's that, I'm in the UK, so that's very UK oriented that we're still waiting for the pubs to open because we'd all like to have a pint. Uh, but uh, you know, it doesn't seem to apply somehow to the protests. And, and they're saying that the cases of COVID will probably go up as a result of this fact that so many people are out doing this. So uh, we'll see how that goes over the next few weeks, I imagine. Um, so just to take a step back for a second, this was something that came into my inbox yesterday from this list I'm on. I kind of get these little inspirational daily thoughts or whatever. And it, it really struck me because it was, you know, it's so much of what I've been working on and it has nothing to do with information science in this list, but it, it asked me to think about to ensure that information you share is in fact true. And one plus one equals three. <laughs> So I thought this was really, really important to include uh, in my talk just because it was very coincidental, or maybe not, um, but just because I think that these kinds of things are, are in people's minds, maybe eventually we'll get to more and more and more people to be thinking about what it is that we're doing um, and what we can do to provide safer information for ourselves and for others and keep ourselves safe, but we have a very long way to go. Um, this was another meme. So um, you can type your answer in the chat if you'd like. What is the dumbest thing Trump has said? Inject people with disinfectant. Windmills cause cancer. You clean the cold and you put it back. Nuke you like a hurricane. F-35 jets are invisible. It's wet in terms of water, big water. The Revolutionary Army took over airports in the 1700s. So it's your choice, A through G. If you want to abstain from voting, I completely understand. And I'll say that as an American citizen myself. Um, the thing is about it, though, is that we like to, we talk a lot about Trump being dumb, and you know he's you know I don't think I don't think that's it. I think what he's really really good at is manipulating information and distracting people from what's really going on. Um, here was a Trump a Trump tweet from the 16th of March saying the U.S. will be powerfully supporting those industries like airlines and others that are particularly affected by the Chinese virus. We will be stronger than ever before. And the reason my font looks funny is because I have this little browser extension installed that's called Make Trump Tweets Aid Again. So everything he tweets comes out like little kids handwriting. It just kind of eases it a bit for me to look at it. Um, but one of the things that has been going on in the discussions about how he talks about the virus is that he's, he, instead of saying COVID-19 or coronavirus, he's, he says Chinese virus, it's from China, it's from Wuhan, it's their fault. So he's already bringing in, you know, you know, racism and, and sort of these issues into it that we really are dealing with now. And he, he just seems to be making this worse by calling it the Chinese virus. It's no longer a Chinese virus. It's a worldwide pandemic. And he's still talking about blaming China and, and it just, it's not helping anything. Um, so if we go back to just over a hundred years ago, back to 1819, we had our last worldwide flu pandemic. Uh, but in 1918 and before that, we certainly didn't have Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or these other things trying to tell us um, what's going on. So we had to wait for things like the daily newspaper. Um, this is from October the 5th, 1918. It costs two cents, really expensive. And it's telling us that, you know, there's another death rate record going on, mortalities due to the epidemic. So we had to wait for the daily paper to come out when, when this was going on over 100 years ago but now we get this instantly. So one of the things that I've been following a bit obsessively, I'm not sure it's entirely accurate, but it's called Worldometer. It somewhat reflects the Johns Hopkins University um, statistics, but what it does is it says that it updates it in real time when it gets the information. So I just took the screenshot this morning, as you'll see there, it was a 10.02 a.m. Uh, GMT, so that was earlier today. And if you scroll down, it'll give you a whole breakdown of the different countries and how, how many 
does there have been and how many active cases and how many people have recovered and so on. So as you see, their current count is just over 7 million current cases with about half of them recovering. And so the rest you'll have to assume is either active or um, they're no longer with us. But it's, it's been interesting just to watch the trends. And again, I don't know if it's entirely accurate, but I think it's, it's just, it's an interesting snapshot to me. But so what is the core problem that's going on here? Um, well, the, you know, the, the problem is misinformation. Misinformation is not new. Um, this book, this is a really great book if you can, if you can get, if you can find it, it's about misinformation. Um, they are not information scientists though, they are more um, from, from a more of a hardcore science background. But they talk about living in an age of, of misinformation, an age of spin, marketing, and downright lies. And I really like the fact that they really get straight to the point with that particular quote. Uh, the World Health Organization at the same time, that along with the pandemics, is that we now have a massive, what they're calling infodemic going on. An overabundance of information, some accurate and some not, that makes it hard for people to find trustworthy sources and reliable guidance when they need it. So this is one of their research priorities for the, um, they have a research roadmap for COVID and it's something that I'm working on right now. I'm working on a bit with some of my colleagues um, um, in this area as well. Uh, a few months, it came out just a couple of months ago, obviously it's very recent. Uh, it was a online only version of a JSIST article from several researchers who wrote about this because obviously it wasn't even labeled a pandemic yet when they got this printed. It was just called a global health crisis because it was very early on when they, when they noticed this. And um, they talked about the difference between misinformation, which is just people interpreting things inaccurately. Disinformation is where it's deliberate. Some of the things that the governments are trying to tell us potentially or, or, or somebody trying to sell us something to say, oh, if you, if you eat this, it'll make you feel better, that sort of thing. Uh, so they have a very interesting, useful list of things that we can do from here. And from this, one thing that I got was that we do need more information behavior research um, in the context of pandemics and lockdowns because we have problems with literacy, as we heard in yesterday's keynote we heard about health literacy issues. And media literacy is another one, of course, that affects social media use. And when everything is constantly changing with this online, but we're all sitting in our houses, looking at Twitter, waiting for something to read or look at or to do, what does this do to our information behaviors and what does this do to making health decisions? And they specifically talk about vulnerable groups as well. So people that may not have internet access, people that are of a lower socioeconomic status, people who are older who may not be as um, internet uh, friendly, but are also in the more likely group to become uh, infected with COVID. And so they've got a whole list of action items for information science. So take a look at that article if you have a chance. Um, my colleagues at the Social Media Lab at Ryerson University in Canada, including Anatoly Gruz, who's a good friend of mine, uh, they've been, since the very beginning, they've been analyzing social media, COVID tweets, and other sources of, of information. And they've found so far seven types of misinformation. And these are just preliminary results. But if you go to their website at the Social Media Lab at CA, you can get more information on, on these seven types. But I think that understand what these seven types are, whether it's you know, promoting fake tests or, or saying, oh, this is really not, it was really not from uh, this animal, it was lab created, it was man-made, it was a government conspiracy, all these things going on uh, that are making people believe certain things about, social, about the COVID situation uh, can give us a lot of insight into what we can do to kind of help move things forward in terms of information. So these are the kind of the general questions I've been working with. Um, I think they're too broad at this point to say that they're actual research questions, but I think these are questions that can guide our thinking. Uh, what are the facts, who has them? What are the opinions and who has them? And you know, how do we tell the difference anywhere between facts and opinion? What do we believe and why? And cultural influences. Um, I've included this, this picture of this man. This is from the South China Morning Post newspaper. I included this because I have a, a PhD student who's from China and she was in China when this started. And so when she came back to uh, Scotland in January, she had to do a, um, a sort of a, a, I guess it was called a quarantine at the time for two weeks where she got to her flat. She couldn't come to campus for two weeks because she had been in China. She was a long way from, from Wuhan, but it was still precaution, obviously. Um, and what she said to me recently was that she doesn't understand the Western, um, the, the hesitation of wearing a mask 
because they've been dealing with these kinds of, of epi epidemic situations for so long that wearing a mask is almost natural to them when they go out. And so she's really trying to figure out why it is that everybody's trying to, oh, I don't want to wear a mask, I don't want to wear gloves, I don't want to look silly, I just want to go out, leave me alone. And, and I think she's right that that is sort of an individualist attitude that we can have in Western societies that might be getting in the way of, of protecting ourselves. Um, I've done a lot of work in the past on authority and health information. I started this about 10 years ago when I wrote a, a paper, it was, it was in the uh, ACES Bulletin when we still had that in 2010, where I was talking about the evolving nature of authoritative, or authoritative medical information online. So with social media coming up and anyone being able to write to publish anything, how do we know in this day and age what exactly is authoritative information? Um, because we, traditionally we would always listen to our doctors or we would go to a librarian to find something, uh, but we did, and patients didn't have access to as much as they have now and now there's all these discussion groups and there's a lot of research in our field going looking at people are writing about blogs and tweets and so on about different illnesses. Um, but we don't, we, so we, it, it becomes more complicated because we can no longer say that the doctor is the only authority if other people are saying that people who have a condition are more authoritative in some ways than the doctors because they live with it and the doctors don't. So the idea of cognitive authority from Patrick Wilson and later Su Young Ri with cognitive authority on the web uh, was talking about how much we can trust the information. Originally cognitive authority from Patrick Wilson's perspective was like if it's published in a book, if it's in the library, if the librarian recommends it, sort of all these traditional ways of measuring it were things that uh, we, he, he said that we could use for cognitive authority to determine if we if we trusted a source. But then what I did um, around this time as well with my colleague, Pam McKenzie, at, who's at Western University in Canada when I was still there at the time, um, we came up with this concept of affective authority. When we, we looked at blogs of women with endometriosis, which is a women's health disease, and we realized that there's not only cognitive authority that's discussed in, in their blogs, but also affective authority. So sometimes people think that either the information or the people posting the information is emotionally supportive, or you know, it could be from a spiritual leader who's saying, oh, he, he, he really understands how I'm feeling spiritually, or uh, this person understands what it's like to live through the side effects of this medication because they take it. My doctor has no idea. He's a man. How can he possibly know? Um, so there's a lot of things where, and this has been uh, getting cited more in other uh, health information research recently because there's different types of authority, I believe, and I think that this needs more research to figure out what this means in this day. Um, so we come to the term post-truth, and this was uh, something that has been around now. It started in 2016. Post-truth was the word of the year, according to the Oxford Dictionary. Their, their definition is that it is relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than what appeals to emotion and per, or personal belief. So essentially they're saying that what we feel or what we think is sort of more important to people than facts in this post-truth era of people that believe this way. And this was not started um, in the health information ring. It started in politics because that year, of course, we had Trump's election and the um, UK's Brexit vote. Uh, Far-right populism was becoming more popular. Other world leaders were getting voted in with these sort of far-right views. And there was a lot of uh, political discussion at the time saying that a lot of these things were happening because there was just flat out disinformation and misinformation floating around that made people believe that, oh yeah, actually UK pays 300 million euros a year to the EU or something like that, which was absolutely not true. But it was one of those things that was going around that influenced people to vote to leave. So this was, this is very uh, circumstantial. Um, to look at some things from a few different um, fields that I like to use to influence my own work, uh, this is a book called the post, it's called the post truth era. Uh, his name is Lee McIntyre. Uh, I, I actually heard about his book first when he was doing an interview on CNN, I think a while ago. Um, and going back to Socrates, because misinformation has been around a long time, he said that ignorance can be taught away. But the problem is that people who know the truth are the people who are more likely to do something that is not a good idea. And it doesn't mean that truth doesn't exist when we say post truth, it just means that we, again, like I said before, that people think that facts are less important than the individual ways that we understand the world and what we believe. And the cognitive bias issues come into it, which is related to 
what we believe. And so this can be, you know, from the climate change issues, from people denying climate change, to the Brexit vote, to um, our own perspectives on the Black Lives Matter movement, and things that but we already believe in how this influences what we do in the future. In psychology, this is sort of related that um, psychologists and cognitive scientists are saying that people choose to believe what information appeals to them emotionally rather than what is backed up by facts, which is similar to what the philosopher was saying. We see some of this as well in our own information science research that we like, we like to get information that aligns with our own worldview. Um, so one of the problems we have that's going on right now is, you know, if, you, if you're a Trump supporter and you're an American, you believe Trump, and Trump tells you to drink disinfectant to get rid of your, your prevent your coronavirus from happening. Do you, do you drink the disinfectant or do you look at the NHS and BBC and World Health Organization tell, telling you, don't do this, it will kill you. Um, and then also in cognitive science, they have found that people with higher cognitive ability are more likely to change what they think about something when they find out that inf information they previously knew is countered with factual information. So if previously they just had an opinion thinking, um, oh, disinfection is a good idea, I think I'll get a bottle. But then they see something from the, uh, the World Health Organization saying, no, this will kill you, they're more likely to back off and, um, and not take it because they didn't know that it was, it was a problem. This is a really, really good paper. Um, again, it's from sort of applied uh, cognitive science and psychology. Um, where he's talking about the, very, the many different things that influence uh, what misinformation and the fact that it's happening now in this post-truth post age. So misinformation is not just only about correcting or improving our cognition or we're not smart enough or whatever, but it has a lot of uh, influence comes in from different ways of thinking, these alternative views, these alt-right, alt-left views, whatever you want to call them. And he sees it as a power struggle because there are so many trends within society, within money, uh, issues, politics, the media, all these things that are telling us that, that this has lead, led to this because we're all, they're all struggling for power, for money, for content, whatever it is that they're, that they're after. And what I like what he said here about post-truth worlds is that it allows people to choose their own reality because, uh, and I'm not sure if you use the word Trump, uh, on purpose or not, where facts and objective evidence are trumped by existing beliefs and prejudices. So we can find information anywhere that we want to believe or that makes us feel better. And if we want to believe that drinking disinfectant will kill COVID, then we'll drink it because we want to have some sort of simple solution to get better. So he talks about some different solutions, uh, things that we could think about in the world, which are, again, the literacy education issues, and some things that we're already doing in information science, including some of my own students, which is working on things like uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence techniques to do fact checking on tweets and things that are available to see what's really going on, um, breaking up the filter bubbles that we all sort of live in. So, you know, we all, I was looking for um, some alt-right Facebook posts on my Facebook feed to include in this presentation, and I couldn't find any. Then I realized I live in a filter bubble of people who did not believe in um, conspiracy theories related to coronavirus because we couldn't find any. So he talks a lot about our information architecture design and combining that with behavioral economics to help fight the spread of information, which includes both uh, education and better journalism, but that a lot of this has to do with the systems and how our information systems are built. So there are definitely also some implications there for information science work. On social media specifically, um, it, 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 this information is easy to spread because if you ever think about how easy it is to just share a tweet or you know retweet something or put something up on Instagram, it's like, oh, that's I really like that. That's really cute. So you just click the retweet button. So it doesn't require a lot of action or time or effort from us as the user or the sharer, but psychologically we get benefit from it. If we feel good and we get a little dopamine hit when we come back, oh, oh, I had 20 likes on that. It was a really great post. I feel better. Everyone loves me. Right, so that's part of our motivation. Um, there's also a lot of work going on in the area of bots and how bots, especially from uh, certain governments uh, and public figures, and, and uh, basically authoritative organizations and things. That we've... Oh, sorry, somebody have a question? No, okay. Um, so the bots are are constantly spreading all this kind of misinformation. Um, and you'll see their citation uh, with um, myself, one of my, my, my doctoral students, 
Fatima, who's on this uh, call, I believe, today, uh, where she's working on Twitter and authority and misinformation in the context of dementia and dementia-related tweets. It's very interesting. So she's, we're, that's in a paper that's been coming out this year. Um, another paper that, that, talked, that looked at Facebook users and how they share information showed this thing about how we all get similar content, which, which creates what they call these echo chambers, which means that we're all talking to each other. So I have, an, I have echo chambers of people who believe in science and other echo chambers that other, some of my family members might believe in that believe in conspiracies. So, you know, we can say that this, we can blame Facebook and Twitter for, well, this is based on the algorithms, this is what they put forward and make us do. Um, but these are also choices that we make because it makes us feel better to see information that we agree with. So whether or not it's a, a conscious or an unconscious choice, it's really easy to blame the algorithms, and I don't think it's entirely their fault. I think some of it comes to do with our own personal choices as well. So with conspiracy theories, um, bring these up because there's a lot of them out there. It, what I've read is that people who feel like they don't have any control over things are more likely to believe in conspiracy theories because it helps us uh, find, find our beliefs and feel better about what we believe, even when they're irrational, because we're trying to seek patterns to find answers to what's going on in the world. Uh, and these researchers are talking about how we really need to study them more, because obviously, in this case, and even before this, because this was published in 2018, that they're harming the health and well-being. Here's one example. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to the InfoWars website. This is run by uh, somebody who's a conspiracy theorist, and uh, or that's what other people in the media will, blame, will call him. Uh, but they claim to debunk the misinformation on the site. So this is when it starts to get tricky, right? Because, you know, one of the headlines that was out there this morning, which I, I just got off there, in the mainstream media will hype adverse reactions to Trump's vaccine preparation for the Bill Gates funded shot. Because one of the conspiracy theories that's out there is that Bill Gates wants to decrease the world population because he thinks we're overpopulated and that it, Trump is, is, is working with other people to work against this. And, and, so, and so if you see the comments down here that were on this article, um, anyone that takes Zionist Trump's vaccine will not be around for any elections except in hell where that vaccine will send you. So they're showing you that the sort of anti-vaccine people are believing in um, the Bill Gates side or the Trump side opinion. Uh, so this is, there's a whole list of things here that I won't go into because I'm running short on time, but um, the World Health Organization has a, a long list of, of things that are dispelling misinformation and the conspiracy theories. Some, some of them are really funny um, in certain ways because things like drinking alcohol does not protect you against COVID-19 and can be dangerous. I'm not sure where that one came from, but I would say that drinking alcohol is helping some of us get through lockdown and quarantine. I will admit that, my evening glass of wine. Um, but all the way to, you know, the 5G networks were, were causing it, and that was a government conspiracy theory that apparently they said it started in China, and they, they burned down some 5G towers in the UK because they thought it was spreading uh, COVID in the UK, and so on. So there's all these different things that, for each one of these, the World Health Organization has different points and breaks them down a bit. So when we think more about all of these lies and these disinformation campaigns and the things that the, that the sort of main outlets of information sources are trying to tell us is that they get themselves into more trouble. This was uh, something that was uh, shared on social media where this woman was, the, 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 if you heard about it, the President Trump went into his bunker last Friday night when there was the protest going on around the White House. So he went to his bunker because he got scared. But now the attorney, the attorney general is saying things were so bad that the Secret Service recommended that the president go down to the bunker. So instead of making it sound like it was Trump's idea because he got scared, now he's, they're saying it was a Secret Service recommendation to try to make him look a little stronger than he might be. So there's a, a certain amount of emerging work in COVID in this area. Um, obviously, there's not much because it's still so new. Um, the Oxford Internet Institute is looking at content uh, from governments and, and public figures and finding out that even though there's not a lot of disinformation compared to misinformation, they're very good at distracting and the strong engagement. So not, you know, like the Trump tweets, but also other governments, other uh, stars, celebrities, things, people that people follow a lot on social media. Uh, the study from 2020 from Kim from South Korea he called it Wuhan pneumonia in the paper, and I think that was because it didn't, probably when he wrote this paper, it was so early that we didn't have another name for it. 
Um, and they found that people have bigger social networks and more positive responses to their posts, led to more civil posts and less negativity and, and bad discussion and things like this. Uh, Sinelli looked at five different social media platforms and they found how um, the different platforms really influence interactions uh, and, and as well as what those groups do on each platform. This was the first time I personally had heard of a, the social network called Gab, which is a, an alt-right um, uh, social network for people that there, one of the things that major findings was it was that on Gab there was more conspiracy theory type posts than there were on the other sort of mainstream social media outlets that we think of. Uh, we don't know whether it's unintentional. We might be sharing this information as people because we don't realize, we don't think about, is this really true? We just see something and we react and we share it and we're just trying to seek attention. So if it's going to get us attention that, oh, look, here's the cure to COVID and then you're, you know, you're going to get a lot of attention from your followers and maybe that's what some people want. And, but there's also the good side of social media, which is we're using it and we are using it in some ways for organizing um, assistance for, to everyone and so on who, who need, has needed help through the pandemic. Uh, YouTube has a medical information, medical misinformation policy. This is just the first part of it here. You can go read the whole thing, but this is where they're saying they will not uh, allow any videos to stay posted that contradict uh, any of the World Health Organization's or local health authorities' guidance. And there's been a lot of controversy about that because the conspiracy theorists and people with other beliefs are saying you shouldn't be allowed to do that. And there was the, the famous situation just a couple of weeks ago where Twitter decided to start getting into Trump's tweets and saying it violated, he violated the Twitter rules about glorifying violence. And uh, so you had to click on another link to actually see the post where he, when he talked about when the looting starts, the shooting starts. And that was um, obviously not a good thing for a president to say. Uh, there was another one about mail-in ballots where he was trying to say that people who mail-in ballots to an American election will, will be fraud and, and incorrect ballots. And so they have a page that you can read about mail-in ballots, about the facts about that. So in response, he signed an executive order on preventing online censorship. So again, we're twisting around this idea of information misinformation, saying that um, that, that, that social media outlets shouldn't have the ability or the, the, to choose what Americans may access and convey on the internet because it is fundamentally un-American and anti-democratic. So they're saying uh, social media companies are abusing their power and so on. That's what his executive order said. So well, I think this is just, getting, I've got like two slides left, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, so the plot is only gonna get thicker from here, I think, because now that we've got the um, uh, Antifa, the, the sort of an, all, a far left organization that Trump is trying to blame some of the protests on, that's not really, uh, now they're saying well, some, some of the groups pretending to be Antifa were actually um, alt-right organizations. And so now we don't even know who to trust in terms of one side might be pretending to be the other side. So how do we really know what's going on? And, and, and I think this will, it's all just going to continue to get more and more complicated as we go along. So here's just uh, to sort of conclude this, uh, the work that I think that we can do, a lot more we could do, but just some ideas for each area of our field. So in research, we need a lot more research into information behavior, social media, pandemic, civil rights movement, it's really complicated, what do we do? Um, people in practice need to develop uh, health and literacy health literacy and media literacy for people, especially those who are information poor and who are vulnerable to uh, virus infection. We need to think about, and those of us who teach in ILS, what we're teaching our students to make sure that they're, they're learning skills that are very up to date in terms of social media, machine learning, data science, and so on. And what can we do locally for ourselves and for our institutions to try to help uh, combat things locally and then have it spread worldwide? So this is just one of the graphics that the World Health Organization tells us to share uh, widely. This one is about not introducing bleach into your body, uh, but there's a whole page of them from that, uh, that slide I mentioned earlier. So uh, I, I just would like to ask, you know, I'm happy to take questions. Um, you know, we've got 10 minutes left, I guess, to the break, but I just would like to say in closing that we have a lot to do. I hope that this doesn't answer everything I know, but I hope that it does give us some ideas on how we can move forward as a community in information science to try to combat this problem that is actually taking lives, which is very important, um, as much as we can do in what we have. Thank you very much.